Okay, good morning. My, uh, my name's Ian Stewart. I'm up from Hamilton. And uh, if you're in Hamilton, we have a Hamilton Python user group. Uh, we meet on the second Monday of the month. So if you're ever staying in Hamilton on, on a Monday night, uh, then please come along. There's no, no cover charge or anything like that. Um, then you can find the details on meetup.com. Okay, um, this presentation is also posted on GitHub. Um, you can see the account there. And uh, if you want to download uh, not only the, present, the slides, which are in PDF format as well, but uh, there's about 14 little uh, demo clips of code there that you can uh, use. And the idea of this presentation is that the material is sort of a reference document, so you should be able to, using this slideshow, get yourself up and going in running. Well, the first thing is doing client-server programming model. The second one is that you'll be using the desktop uh, bus for the communication, and you'll be using the PyD bus Python library. Um, and if you want to, you can chuck in a bit of system D. So we've got to cover these things today in uh, 30 minutes, so I'll do my best. Uh, right. Um, I won't go through all the parts of the presentation. I'll just get on with it, which is uh, we'll just look at the four, uh, four, uh, four components to the, that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you think of the client-server model, I'm pretty sure it came around with the uh, beginning of the internet where we've got clients out there communicating through the internet to a web server. So your browsers like Mozilla Firefox and um, Chromium, things like that, connect them through the internet. Um, another version of the client-server model can be internal to the computer where the software bus is, is internal inside uh, the system and your client applications talk to the server application. When you're doing this, um, there's probably something going on in the background, like a message uh, bus daemon to take care of routing. And um, this will be transparent to you, and it'll also be launched uh, automatically when the system boots. So I'm just pointing it out that it's there, but you don't really need to um, worry about it. The D-Bus uh, itself is a software bus that allows computer programs concurrently running on the same machine to communicate. Um, first stable release was 11 years ago, and it was um, the work of three chaps, two of them from Red Hat there. And the latest update to the spec was this year at um, 0.31. So there's been about 20 releases over 10 years, so every uh, about two a year. And you can actually go to that specification there. In fact, to, to, you will need to. I'll, uh, later on, you'll see why. Okay. Um, the D-Bus, um, just some of the aspects of it. Uh, the free software uh, desktop.org project developed a free and open source software library called libdbus, which you may have heard of. Um, it's a pretty standard distribution. And um, when we're working with the D-Bus, there is two buses that we actually can work with. One's the system, and one's called the session bus. We'll start off uh, looking at using the session bus, and then later on do some system bus stuff. Um, it's been implemented, the specification's been implemented using, um, uh, for example, GD bus, and there's also the QT libraries have a QT bus. SD bus is um, system daemon bus, kernel D bus, and there's more, right? So I'm going to focus on the GD bus, and um, I, I guess you guys are familiar with it, but you've got the um, GIO is uh, a bunch of... Uh, C programs which uh, the G object library can get to. And um, uh, there is a Python binding which allows you to, to go into the G object and then get to the GIO um, C code. So anyway, that, that's fairly low level. So PyDBus sits on top of this as a Python wrap, wrapper for uh, getting to these uh, GIO libraries that can do the D-Bus uh, transactions. Okay, so uh, Pi D-Bus was created by this chap Linus from Poland. This is his um, web, web page where you can see the source code. Um, he uses the MIT license. If you've got a recent uh, uh, distro, 
then you'd just be able to do a direct install like that. Uh, otherwise, if, if you're using PIP3, then I would suggest putting a, a target and, um, and, and making it system-wide. Because if you're later using the system D bus, you, you, you want it to be able to be controlled by root, things like that. But you've got to find it. Um, if, I, if I just look at what gets downloaded in the package, um, a total of 18 files, and they're all Python files and about 1.8 KB uh, bytes per file. There's a black duck that does um, analysis of uh, code. Here you can see he started the project around 2015, uh, been reasonably stable the last 12 months, and um, only 1,200 lines of code. And it shows up as 81% uh, Python. The HTML, I think, is the comments within the, within the, the code. And so you might say, well, why PyDBus? It's, it's a high-level uh, approach to, to doing this, uh, these transactions. Um, it's simple to implement. Uh, many aspects of DBus are automatically assigned, so that makes it even more simple. Um, development can focus on client-server code, you know, and, and, and you don't have to worry so much about the intercommunication. So you, you um, can also then have modular software development. Guys can be writing client code, other guys can be writing server code, that approach. And the data integrity, from my understanding, on the DBus is, is assured. So you're not sitting there checking the, the validity of the data that comes through. Um, this is quite a common diagram that you'll see for trying to explain how the, um, the DBus works. And I think the green is meant to be clients and the pink is meant to be servers. And then this breakdown of a server we have what's called the well-known name is on the outer side, and then we go to the object layer, and then the interface layer, and then we get down to methods. Um, and um, also over here, we've got unique connection name. When you're using PyDBus, you're basically are interested in the, the bus name here, or the well-known name, and in the method. Okay? All this other stuff just sort of gets, you don't have to worry about it, which is kind of cool. Um, to get things working, there's a, a, a tool that ships called the GDBus tool. Um, it's included with most Linux distributions. It's written in C, so I assume it's available on other OSs. Um, th this tool will allow you to simulate method calls to a server, um, in install the server, and, and, and debug it before you, you pot around with the client. Rather than have two, a client and a server that are both buggy and you're trying to make, make them work, you get one working with this tool and the other one working with the tool and then join them together. So it allows you to test the code in isolation. Um, these are a couple of links to this particular um, uh, utility. So let's start developing a server application. And <coughs> we can do uh, method calls to the server, right? And there's four types of method calls. The simple one has no arguments. So if you had a server that's playing music, then you would just send, the client would just send stop or play or rewind. It doesn't have to say rewind one minute. It doesn't need to send any data. It just sends um, a method with no arguments. Likewise, you can send, uh, send, the client can send with an argument or data, or likewise, the, um, the client can not send any data, but the, the response from the server is to receive some data. And the fourth alternative is both sending and receiving data for every method call. Okay, the, different from Python here, the data type is static, so it must be declared. Um, you have to put in type equals s to indicate it's string data you're passing. Um, I for 32-bit integer, D for double precision, and things like that. That's where I said you'd be back to the specification. There's about 10 different um, codes that you need to look up to know um, uh, which data type, uh, you, you know, depending on which data type you're using. Okay, so we're going to write server uh, demo number one, and the first thing we'll need to do is from PyBus, we'll have to, we're going to import the session bus, okay? And we, we've um, instantiated it there, and we've we set up a constant here of uh, the well-known name for the server. 
Okay? And when we go to start our program, we um, publish the, uh, the, the bus, and the next little bit is on the next slide. Um, to keep the whole server running, we're going to uh, use the glib main loop, and this, this keeps, it, keeps it looping. Okay? And over here is where we uh, define the, the services. So, as you can see here, this is a doc string, and then I've got dbus equals as a keyword. It's like a reserved word that the pydbus guy has flogged. Um, he, you'll see examples where he, if you just make that the doc string, if there's nothing between there and there, it will still work. So he kind of flogs the right to use the doc string, and, and he uses it to actually define his code, which... Um, I didn't quite like. So I've, I've found this keyword, and I prefer to put the keyword and then have a doc string above it. Um, OK, so I'm just going to have a little method on the server called server no args. So it's going to receive my play, stop, or rewind commands. OK? Um, in, in fact, what, it, what it'll do is whenever uh, the client sends, uh, calls the method server no args, there's nothing, no arguments come in, and all I'll do is print this is message one, two, three, or whatever. So um, using, we start the server as demo one, and using gdbus tool, we do a call, okay? We're using the session bus. We have to put in some of the stuff that I said we normally only have to worry about that, but we have to add a bit more to keep gdbus happy. And then right at the end, here's my call to the um, method called server no args. And each time I, I re redo this, little tool, it will it produces a message from the server. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Um, next method was to um, get some data from the server. So we've, we've, we're going to have a method name called get timestamp. And this time we have to say that it's sending a double precision bit of data and it's, um, the direction will be out of the server to the client. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. Um, so we, here's our little method here, get um, timestamp, no input, and all we return is time.time .time, uh, function. And when we run the server using this tool, we, we say get timestamp, and back comes the timestamp. We run it again, and back comes the timestamp. Okay? The third method is we're going to randomly send a name to the server. So we're, we're expecting a script. Uh, we're going to call it greeting, this is the method, and we're expecting a string to be coming in to the server, okay? As, so down here is our method, greeting, and now we've got name here. So the data that comes in will be assigned to the variable name, and when we go print hello and name, then we should see here we're randomly, well, we're sending names like Bob, Fred, Wendy, Okay, and the server is picking up the name and putting hello in front of it. Okay, and the fourth one is to be able to echo. So um, we now have to define two arguments here, one for direction in and one for direction out. So we're, we're doing string in on and string out on both occasions. And um, if we look here at echo string, um, we're just going to, with the input string, we're going to turn it around and send it back out. As, and um, when we run our little tool, we start the server, run our little utility, and when I uh, say call the method echo string to hello world, <coughs> then it will come back with hello world once upon a time, stuff like that. Okay, so that was doing those, uh, that's checking that the servers work. The, the, the next thing we've got to do is, is, is write a client, okay? And um, there's only really one more step, or one step that's different. We, again, we import the bus we prefer, in the session bus, and we instantiate it here. We've, we've set up the, um, the constant for the name of, of the, the bus we're using, and we, we create this server object, okay, using the get uh, under pydbus, this get uh, function, and it, it instantiates the server object. 
just down here, we're going to, um, when we start the program, we're going to, uh, just every two seconds, we're going to call this little routine on the client, and the server object will call the method server no args, and we are going to look for a reply, although we're not expecting one, and um, so that, that will just, and then it will come out of there, and two seconds later we'll come back and do it again. So we start the server, and this time when the client starts, every two seconds it makes a call to the server no args method through the uh, session dbus, and um, each time it will produce a little message on the console of the server. Um, in this case, we're, we're um, getting the timestamp. So uh, the only bit of code I, I change is that um, every two seconds, I'm going to say, um, get the timestamp. I don't have to send anything to it, but the reply will come back, and we'll see what type it is, and the timestamp data will come back. So you can see the uh, data type is a float that comes back, and, and this is the timestamps, and they're going up, incrementing by two second intervals. Um, the third type, we send a random name from the client to the server, and the server's going to just say hello, whatever your name is. So we start the client here. The server's already been running, and um, here we go. Uh, we, we go to the greeting uh, method, and we pass the name that we randomly selected from this list. And that name will get printed out by the server. <coughs> if you remember the fourth type, we've got an echo. So, um, oops, I'll go backwards. Four. Okay, went backwards. Sorry. Um, the fourth type, we're just again going to pick a name. We'll send that name to the server, and the server will turn it around and send it back. So, um, when we run that, so the reply coming back here, message echoed from server. So name sent to server is Fred. <coughs> name echoed is Fred. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> okay. So that's it with with uh, the the um, whew, the methods. There's another feature of the Dbus, and that's called to emit a signal over the Dbus. Okay. Um, here's a piece of server code designed to emit signals, and we've got um, uh, one more line in our import statements where we import the signal class from uh, the PyDBus uh, library. <coughs> okay, and I don't think that, oh yeah, and then down here, we, we just um, instantiate a wee bit differently, and we bring out um, an object called emit here, and we're going to emit every Two seconds. We're going to call a little function called timer. So we go to the bit of code that sits in the middle between here. Then um, when we set up and define our service, we now have a signal name called integer signal. And the argument type is i and uh, for integer or 32-bit signed integer. And we also have to instantiate integer signal equals the signal from the PyD bus library. A little timer that we come to every second randomly gets a, a um, number from 0 to 100, and it emits it here. Okay, So let's see. Using our GDBus monitor, we can monitor the session bus. That should, should carry on there. And, um, and we start the server, so it randomly uh, emitting an integer value here. And using the GDBus to monitor it, we see that um, these are the, this is the data being picked up. Okay, so the, the we know that our server is is emitting OK over the uh, the session dbus. Now we need to write a little client to subscribe and receive these emitted data, emitted signals. So um, do we have to import? We don't need to import anything more. We we're already importing the session bus, um, we, we have to include bus.subscribe, okay? And it, it will, whenever, once we've subscribed and applied the filter of what we're subscribing to, then whenever a signal comes in that, that 
uh, matches that filter, it, we will trigger callback signal emission. So this piece of code, we, we pass all the arguments of what came in, and we hunt through it, and uh, argument number four, good grief, argument number four is um, uh, the data. So the client received random number, and when we run our code, this is the server emitting, and the, the client is picking up these, these same numbers here. The, the first one's missing because I start the server code, and then I go to the other console and start the next one. So that's, that was, it, it's my delay there. Okay, you probably don't believe all that you've heard, so I'll just try and prove what I'm talking about. <coughs> We're going to run server demo number six, which combines everything together as one thing. So when I start this, server demo number six, it's emitting the random numbers, okay? If I go over here and I say just use the GD bus monitor, then uh, at the moment the monitor can only monitor for um, uh, what's emitted onto the bus. So you should see we're emitting these numbers and the same numbers are being picked up. Whoops. Okay. So now let's, if I actually run a client, then the, um, as well as this, it's receiving these numbers now, but it'll also do the four things. So this is a message in the Hello Wendy when we send things from the client to the, um, to the server. And when stuff comes from the server to the client, we've got um, uh, the timestamps are here, coming through every four seconds, it is, I think. Yeah, and, um, and I'm echoing just a letter instead of a name. So, so um, it's not all smoke and mirrors. Right, I'll just carry on. Okay, that was all about using the session bus, which was like local to each user. I'm now going to just talk about using the system bus, okay? And this, is, this was it here. So we had like two session buses, and they're, they're independent of each other. So what we want to look at with the system D bus is um, we could have server applications here, and different users can get to, the, to those applications, okay? Meanwhile, this is sort of happening in the background, this message demon routing thing. Another thing that can happen is we want to pass the whole thing over. So, for example, whenever the server starts up, we want uh, system D to, to launch the um, server application and uh, or, or potentially a client application could also, let's say, backup. It could be a client that runs every day or something. Um, so, so that can launch and then users can log in and make use, run clients that make use of that. So we're going through the system D bus. So here's just how to set up the system D bus. Oh, what happens that goes backwards? Um, I, 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 in this case, I'm going to create a little um, a, a folder demo slash test off my um, home directory and, and put in there that um, well, server six, but I'm going to call it server seven, so same piece of code. The only changes I have to make is I change the session bus here to be system bus, okay, and, and I instantiate the system bus before I was instantiating the system bus. So those are the only changes between version six and version seven of my little server code, and when you run it, of course, it doesn't work. And um, when you dig through a page or so of errors, you get this um, thing here, dbus error, due to security policies, and I can assure you putting sudo in front doesn't help. Um, so you have to look into why that's happening, and you'll find that the dbus is configured in a file uh, in user share dbus one um, system conf. is gets run every time uh, the system boots and, and the dbus is set up. And there's a note in there, you, you add a system local conf uh, rather than edit anything directly in this file. And you can see the code tests for is there a ETC dbus1 system local conf included on the system, and if there is, go run it. And so to make it, the easiest thing to do is just copy the user share system.conf 
to um, systemlocal.conf in etc dbus. And so we've now got this file here, which is identical. And then go through it and chop out all the stuff you don't want and make a little change. They call it punching holes into this file. So there was deny own equals star and deny send type method call. I comment that out and I change it to allow. So those are the only two lines I change, but I have to pass the whole like, frame. There's about 10 lines missing here. If you, if you look at my um, GitHub site, if you go there and you, you look at the server demo 7.py um, file, I've actually, at the bottom of it, in the comments section, I've added um, exactly what, I, what this file is or how I set it up. Okay, so now when we go to, um, is it finished? Oh, this thing goes backwards. Okay, um, now we, um, notice I reboot, there's probably a way of reinitializing the dbus, but it, one of the easiest ways is to reboot. And um, when I run my server demo, it's emitting um, uh, random numbers, and when I start, use the gdbus monitor, I'm picking up these um, random numbers, okay. And to now write a client, um, again, all, the, all I really change is um, from PyD bus import to system bus and instantiate it. And um, with, now when I run my server, as well as emitting the random numbers, I'm picking up um, client uh, method calls from the client. <coughs> so there's five things happening there. You're getting your emitting and you're getting your four types of method calls. Okay, and uh, probably the last thing is that you, you want to be able to um, uh, get the uh, system D to be able to launch your, your applications. Um, and uh, I guess you know about etc system D slash system is where you put service, services that you want uh, executed in there. Um, here I've created server demo dot service and I'm saying go here and run server demo 7.py um, whenever you boot up the system. And um, I can test it out. The first thing I must do is a daemon reload and then start uh, system control start server demo service and I can check the status of it. And if I was going to do it permanently, so I want it every time it boots, then the system control enable is used. Okay. And um, if we look over here, there's a wonderful thing called journal E. If you've got journals that are that wide to get all the information that it has in it. But if I've stripped off all the time stamping prior to the colon. But you can see here, here this was me reloading the daemon. And then down here, I start up, um, I start up my server somewhere. Uh, anyway, yeah. Server demo service, yeah. Okay, started server demo 7.py. Okay, notice my, because I print things, my server prints things, they end up in this log. So I wouldn't actually recommend you write a server application that prints to a console. Um, okay, so just some notes on system D. Um, client applications may also start, be started by uh, the system control module. Um, an alternative is to insert into the server uh, code a subprocess call to actually start the client. So you, as you come up, you start the server through system D and then do a call within that um, code to start your client. Um, having the code in a user account means that you can edit the code uh, without having to have priv and things like that. So for debugging purposes, it's a lot easier to keep things in your local account while, while you get you know, before you say move it system wide, um, yeah. So you maybe your final version you move files created by server. Okay, if you if you've had it started by um, system D, then it's owned by root. So if you're say you you create a log file and you write to the log file, if your server application has to do that, it will have been created with root privileges. So when you've you know, want to go and get that log file, you, you, you're trying to get a root file, you might need priv to get it. So you, you may, may need to play around with um, changing the ownership 
of, of, of the file. It's easy enough to do, but um, just worth bearing in mind. Okay, we've still got some time. Can I just go a little bit more? I've just got some demos. Um, Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. I've started a server application, and just so that I know it's running, it pops out a number every second. Okay. And now I'll just start. And, and the idea is my little server is, is, is controls this brewery or pub, you know. And, and this is the billboard sign outside the pub, and it's, it's saying that beer is priced at 10 bucks, and... This is an emitted signal from the, the server, and I'm using uh, GTK clients, and I'm using the GTK loop, and, and that's fine. You know, it, it, it works. That, uh, before you saw me using the GL main loop, and um, you know, I'm not obliged to, to be stuck with that. <coughs> what I can do is have a bar manager come along, and he can declare it's happy hour, and, and he sends a method call <coughs> to, the, to the server and the price of beer has been dropped by three bucks to down to three dollars and that's broadcast to the display board or emitted, okay? And um, at that point, a lot of people will come to the pub, I would imagine. And, and so next to this, um, our beer sales will be starting to get busy. So um, every two or three seconds, we sell, we get an order for like six beers or two beers at $3. And, um, and this is the receipts being issued. And again, these are all client calls to the server. Okay. Um, and of course, along comes the accountant eventually. And he wants to know, are you in business? Are you making? And so if we press that, you can see that by selling beer at, at happy hour at three bucks, we're actually running at a loss. So the accountant gets in touch with the uh, bar manager and he increases happy hour prices to six bucks. And um, what you should find now is that we've finished here at the three dollar beers and we've gone up to the six dollar beers and we're now making a profit on those. So again, this one here in blue is the only one where the client is receiving emitted data from the server. The other three uh, are working on uh, doing a method call to the server and getting um, uh, some data back. In, in some cases, like this one, it's actually passing, uh, passing data to the method call and, and I guess it's getting some back as well. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's bi-directional. Okay. So that's one little thing there. I've just got one more thing I'd like to show you guys. I'll just set that down. Um, um, ah, man. Okay, this is a practical example of using client server. Um, if you're into electric bikes, this is a little um, thing called a cycle analyst that you can plug onto a, an electric bike. And it gives you things like you know, your battery and your voltage and the watts you're consuming and your kilometers per hour and things like that. It also, this is sort of how it all connects together with the electric hub on your bike and your battery and the electric brakes for regenerative braking, that sort of thing. But there's also a data out feed, which um, sends out TTL data every second. Um, and the data out is uh, about 70 characters and 14, 14 a string of, of string data, 70 characters, but 14 tab delimited uh, floating point numbers, decimal points. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I built this little thing, or, or no, JCA Electronics built it. It's a little UART to Bluetooth converter. So I just plug that into the uh, cycle analyst. And it broadcasts um, the, the, the packet every second to um, this little thing, which is a Raspberry Pi 3 sitting inside a box with two loudspeakers, and they're meant to be waterproof. Um, 
and that's a little amplifier in there. And so the, it, the, this, the Raspberry Pi 3 has Bluetooth capability. And um, the, 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 the roles here, uh, this, for the server, it receives the Bluetooth data from the psychoanalyst transmitter every second. I'm actually using async I.O. Um, uh, event loop, which is in part of uh, Python 3.5 onwards, uh, rather than the glib main loop to actually keep the uh, polling for my data coming in. Um, I verify the data, which is 70 characters or so, and 14 tab delimited floating point values. Uh, I log the data to disk um, every second, and I also, once I've verified that I've got good data, I emit the data over the system dbus, okay? I then have a, a, another program which is also launched on boot by System D, um, called the client, and uh, uh, he he's polling all the time for uh, receiving data over the System D bus. Uh, he'll filter all that data to see whether it matches um, a couple of algorithms I've got there. Uh, I don't really want it. Basically, the idea is that the loudspeakers will will tell a guy that's sitting on the bicycle it will speak things to him. Um, for example, down here the audio messages are, one type will be something like speed 20 watts 800, and the other one will be distance 10 kilometers, um, amp hours 4, and voltage 52. So, so that's, um, that, those are the, the messages. And I, depending on how you're riding, whether you're going up hills or down hills, the messages come at a rate of between, say, every 15 seconds, or it could be five minutes if you were cruising along steadily and there's nothing much changing. But I can tweak those algorithms and it means all I'm tweaking is the client code. I don't have to worry, look at the server code or anything like that. The algorithms are totally in the client code. And um, you might ask, <laughs> why, why would you do this? Um, this, this is a, uh, a couple of, a guy and his wife. Um, she's uh, sighted, so she does the driving. Um, he's blind, so he, he sits on the back and this photo was taken before I made the machine, but he then has the little speaker on the back, and every few seconds it tells him, gives him an update of um, his speed and, and things like that. So, um, and I don't need to run any wires. The cycle analyst, the, the, here's the, the trailer pushes along, and the, there's a cable running up to that cycle analyst, which is up here, so the uh, driver can see, and then it's transmitted back to, to the Raspberry Pi here, and he can just hear it and, and know. Um, <laughs> how much reserve capacity he's got on his battery and things like that. And that's his dock. Okay, so I think, well, I haven't gone over my time. I think that's about, about it. Um, okay, as I mentioned, all my, uh, these presentations are, are, are at this link here. So I think that's about it. Has anyone got any questions about my presentation or? Anything you couldn't follow? <laughs> hey, yeah, one question. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, so when would you say it's a good idea to use like D-Bus in general? Because as far as I understand, when you're using D-Bus, you're essentially kind of limiting yourself. It's like for Linux only, right? Be becomes a Linux only thing. Um, so why not, like, I don't know, use sockets like, or, or, or just network? W when do you want to use Dbus instead? Well, I, 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 admittedly, I don't use, I, you know, I, I only use Linux, but um, as far as I know, Dbus is not a, a specification just for, for Linux. I, I think it's been adopted by um, Microsoft and, uh, and maybe uh, 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 Apple, I don't know. That, that's my understanding. And um, the uh, Pi Dbus, uh, and the, the G object libraries, I'm pretty sure they, they will all run on, on a Windows platform. So, so I th think that's, you know, I think the flexibility is there. It's just I, I haven't personally um, you know, played around with it. Yeah. The one thing I perhaps could mention is um, latency. Uh, if you were really wanting your data fast off a database, um, the server brings it off the database, and then there may be a one millisecond to get it through from server to client or something like that. Uh, um, I did try uh, get a timestamp, send the timestamp to the server, add a timestamp, send both timestamps back, add a third timestamp, and then look at the differences to see. Uh, and it was within a millisecond, but uh, uh, you know, it, 
in the case of, say, like the bicycle scenario, it doesn't matter, you know, if, if, if there's a delay in going through the buses. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't I haven't actually looked through how the spec guarantees the you know the integrity of the data. Um, yeah, but it, as far as I know, it, it is. I mean, just about everything that's happening on the on the on your screen these days, like you know the little clock ticking over, you can actually go to the get the D bus and you can see the packets going through to say increment the seconds on your clock on the desktop. You know, so. I've never seen the clock suddenly say 61 seconds. Or, you know, like, I've never seen it getting the, the data for the clock being corrupted, or, and that's going on day in, day out. Yeah. So, oh, well, they each have a unique bus, you see. So, I think the server can, can serve, you, you could instantiate different buses on the same server. I think so. So that, then you would, you know, I think that's feasible. And, and, and so, but, but even, yeah. even so, I guess if you, if you had, um, like depending on the data going back, you could say um, message one and whatever, and that is, you know, for, for client one. You, know, you, you could have an identifier on your packet going back. And, and then you filter, your client would be filtering. So you, your client's receiving everything that's coming back for both clients, for example. Uh, then you put a filter in on your, your client. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. I haven't tried any load tests. Yeah. I mean, I'm playing around with one second, one one packet per second. Yeah. No, no problem. But. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, it's a, really a combination. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, guys. Um, <laughs> cheers. <laughs> okay. Sorry about.